You're listening to the GRCC Provost Podcast. Greetings, persons of quality. I am here today with a student profile to follow our most recent faculty profile. And I'm really pleased to have with me Kayla Tucker, who is the editor-in-chief of The Collegiate, and she is a fellow practitioner of the podcast art. In fact, we have done the exact same number, almost, of podcasts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You should listen to her. You can find her at Google Kayla Tucker Podcast. Go to the Collegiate Live website. Where else can we hear What else would we look for to get to you on the podcast? Yeah, so a Google search should work, um, but thecollegiatelive.com is where you can find all my collegiate-related work, which is where the podcast would be. Podcast Mm -hmm. and print, Mm -hmm. and there's a fair amount of it. Is this the second year you've been the editor-in-chief? Yes, yep, Uh and it's my third year at the collegiate in general. Okay, good. So we're just going to chat about you and learn about your sort of your career path, what life is like at GRCC. But first I want to ask, it is, we are recording this on the Friday before spring break. In fact, it's three o'clock on the Friday before spring break. And Kayla is here working hard. Do you have any exciting plans for spring break? I do. Tomorrow at about 5 a.m., my fiance and I are going to drive down to Tennessee to see my great-grandparents. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited. (laughs) Is that a day's drive? Yeah, it's going to take all day. Maybe like 14 hours. I don't, that's a rough guess. I don't know how long it's going to take, but we'll probably get there in the evening. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. You stay a few days? Yeah, we'll probably come back end of next week. Awesome. Yeah. So you're seeing your great grandparents. Mm -hmm. How long has it been since you've seen them? Uh, This time last year. I make it a top priority to see them on spring break because it's the easiest and yeah fun fact uh, my great grandma was a journalist oh my gosh you're kidding me yeah tell me a little bit about her work um well she was a columnist and so she wrote um just kind of the feel-good column every week she told stories about her family dogs basically just a really relatable column from a stay-at-home mom Mm -hmm. type personality yeah very cool. And yeah. was that published in a Tennessee newspaper? Um, it was in Adrian, Michigan. Oh, Adrian, sure. A long time ago. So I don't, I think it was just the local Adrian newspaper. Yeah. yeah. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Besides seeing your grandparents, what fun will you have in Tennessee? Um, well, they live in Great Cross- grandparents. Yeah. Uh, they live in Crossville. So it's small community. It's not very entertaining. So we'll probably just stay there with them, maybe play cards, just hang out in their like senior community for a couple of days. And then I think on the way back, we're going to stop in Mammoth Caves in Kentucky. So that'll be just kind of a day trip. And then we'll be back. to. I've keep always working. wanted to go there. Yeah. I think it would be really cool. So you're going to have to tell me how it, how it is if I, I need to do that. <laughs> um, is your grandmother one of the reasons you pursued journalism? Or how how did you know this is the field I want to go into? Um, I actually didn't know much about her journalism until I was in it. Um, So not really. She didn't really influence me. Um, I grew up always talking about politics with my dad um, and his mom, my grandma. They were always telling me to watch the news, always saying, pay attention to this. And they always put me in presidential debates when I was younger, and I didn't even really know all the words that they were saying. So I feel like I've just always been surrounded by news, and I've always been forced to pay attention, and it just kind of comes naturally as an interest to me. Mm-hmm. So do you see yourself becoming a political reporter? I would say so. I'd say that's one of the options. Um, I have kind of a mental uh, career dream list, and one of them is like a White House reporter. I, would, I think that would be awesome. A DC reporter. Yeah. I think that would be so fun. I can see it. <laughs> I can picture you doing that. What brought you to GRCC? Well, I didn't know I'd be studying journalism when I started. Um, I originally thought political science major. Um, that was one of my first classes freshman year. Um, I came to GRCC for convenience, money. Um, my grandparents let me live with them downtown, so it was easy to walk to campus 
Um, I originally was going to go to Grand Valley right away, but I realized that I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I didn't want to move into a dorm. I didn't want to jump into all that if I wasn't ready for it. So just started here basically just out of convenience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of stumbled onto journalism? Yeah. My first semester, um, I took political science as well as the intro to journalism class um, that is combined with the collegiate. And they were talking about it and they said they had editing positions open I just applied on the first day of class, and I was hired the next week. Were you always interested in writing? It's definitely started with writing. I was always writing ever since first grade. I was in writing competitions, and um, English was my favorite class, so that's where it started. Good for (laughs) you. Extra points in the podcast. So you've worked on the paper for three years, and you've been the editor-in-chief for two. What do you think has been the most challenging or rewarding story that you've worked on? The most challenging stories are the obituaries, because those are the most read stories by the biggest community. Those are the ones people print out and put on their fridge and keep forever. Mm -hmm. Um, And being at a college publication when someone from our college passes away, it's Mm -hmm. also personally affects you as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think the obituaries that I've written about staff members of the college, as well as students that I knew personally, Mm -hmm. were probably the most challenging. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that that would be tremendously emotionally challenging. I, and I, I've never written an obituary. I would think that there would be just struggle to get it perfect. You know, there would be a real, a real pressure to to feel like I have to, I have to do this perfectly because this is a remembrance of this person. Right. I definitely am the most fragile with those stories. I obviously I try my best on every story that I do because sure. it has my name on it. But those ones I pay way extra attention to. Mm-hmm. You are modest, and you would never bring this up, but I would. Your work has garnered quite a number of awards, um, both the paper as a whole and you personally. So I know that recently uh, the Collegiate won a very impressive award. How about you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we just won Division Three Newspaper of the Year from the Michigan Press Association. Uh, for the second year in a row, and that was awesome. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We were very excited about that. Tell us about some of the honors that you yourself received. Um, From that same competition, I got Best Writer, um, which was I was very honored to receive that. Um, And last year at the Michigan Community College Press Association, I got Student Journalist of the Year, Mm -hmm. which was also I was very honored to receive that from both competitions. The, the Collegiate has a long history of, of winning awards. It's been around way longer than I've been here, but I've been at the college about 12 years. You know, ever since I can remember, every year I was hearing about, I'm delighted every year to hear about it. It doesn't get old, about um, the accolades that the, that the paper and its journalists have won. I, I have to say that I, I really just see it has gotten so much stronger two in the last, you know, 12 years. I think even in the last three or four years, even stronger. And there's been such a branching out um, of the kinds of writings and the kinds of um, media that you work in. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So obviously, you know, the media landscape is changing every second, it feels mm-hmm. like, um, with social media being brought into that and um, just all the technology that we can use now. We cut printing this last year, so we haven't been printing newspapers since the spring semester of 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, That was definitely a big change, Um, but I think it needed to happen because people weren't picking up the newspaper like they would have 10 Mm -hmm. years before that. Um, And people are looking online. They're on their phones. They're on apps. Um, So we've been trying to expand As far as social media, we've been trying to do a lot more with our photography, videography, um, and then the podcast. Mm -hmm. I know at least last year you printed a magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the only thing that we print. But um, 
The magazine is printed once a semester at the end. Um, usually exam week is when we'll pass it out. It's the best work of the semester from our writers. Um, it's a lot of personal narratives and profiles, and that's a really fun publication to put together. And that that work um, last year about this time, you were you were all nominated for one of the Armin Awards. Yeah, so that project was called How Do You Live Your Best Life? Mm -hmm. Um, And we originally started, we partnered with Hospice of Michigan, um, and we wanted to relate this organization back to college students. And so we came up with the topic, How Do You Live Your Best Life? How can we, we can ask students these questions. What are you doing right now to ensure that you're going to feel like you've had a fulfilled life and what you wanted to do? the end, that you're not going to be at this point regretting anything. Um, so we, I was one of the lead writers, and we interviewed a couple people that were in hospice. Um, the gentleman that I interviewed, uh, Mr. Booth, I interviewed him and his wife. Um, he actually passed away less than two weeks after our interview. Mm-hmm. That was tough, um, but... It was one of the biggest learning experiences in journalism I've taken away ever. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that story. Mm -hmm. How do you approach a a person whose death is imminent? How do you think about what questions am I going to ask? And just how are they going to be feeling as I'm talking through this? And did you feel a lot of stress or pressure about that? Yeah, so obviously it was a very sensitive story because, um, well, just hospice is sensitive. And then the fact that he did pass away, um, talking to his family after that time, um, I was at the visitation and um, those interviews were tough Mm -hmm. because people are crying and you're just trying to do your job, but you're also Mm -hmm. trying to make the best of this um, story. Mm-hmm. So when we went in to interview uh, Robert Booth, he they told us beforehand that he could not talk for long. He would get very winded. It, it wasn't going to be a long interview. So we just asked him basic questions like, tell us about your life, um, any advice you have for young people, stuff like that. And it was pretty generic mm-hmm. until him and his wife started talking about their relationship and how they met and the love that they shared. And it seemed like he almost had a surge of energy. He sat up in his bed and he went on for maybe 15, 20 more minutes. And they were both just talking with so much energy about Mm -hmm. how important love is, no matter what you do in life, to have that love Mm -hmm. and to prioritize that. Um, It was kind of amazing how it happened. Yeah. Yeah. The thing I was thinking as I watched you all win that award was um, those are some brave journalists. Um, I think that would just, that takes a lot of bravery and strength and courage to do that kind of an interview. Thank you. Um, What do you think are the hardest interviews to do? Again, like those obituary stories, it's Mm -hmm. the same kind of thing. Um, We had a student that was in the journalism class. She was a reporter for a semester, and so I knew her. Um, She was known on campus, and she died in a car accident. We are the same age, and interviewing her mom was very hard Mm -hmm. because her mom was obviously emotionally Mm -hmm. distraught. And so just being able to navigate that interview and ask Mm -hmm. the right questions um, without being insensitive, Mm You just have to be yourself, I would say. That's what I usually default to. Pretty much any interview, I try to be not too formal. Mm -hmm. I try to have a conversation. Um, And in those tough interviews that deal with grief, I usually let them lead the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've talked a little bit about, you know, sort of your dream job might be D.C. reporter, White White House correspondent. And I, I think that would be so cool. I truly do. I would. I like. I would be watching. Like I know her. Okay. Um, where do you see your your career sort of taking you in the interim? Where Where are you headed uh, for your next few years of education? Um, what do you aspire to right after that? Um, I'm graduating this year from GRCC, 
And you're going to go through commencement, aren't you? Yes. Yay. Yep. Okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, Good. I like celebrating every accomplishment, even yep. if it's not the the end, the bachelor's degree. Mm-hmm. I still spent three years here. and Good for yeah. you. Um, I'll be going to Grand Valley State University starting in the fall for multimedia journalism. After that, I guess I don't really know what's going to happen. Um, I'm trying to round out my skills in writing. Um, I've done radio now, and I want, I'm doing some TV stuff. So I'm trying to get myself familiar with all branches of journalism so that when I graduate, um, I have more options. Okay, so I haven't seen you on TV. What are you doing with video? Yeah, so um, last summer I interned at WGVU Radio. Okay. Um, and I did news radio for a summer, and that's where I learned how to do um, my radio voice and audio editing. So that's how I brought the podcast to the collegiate. Um, but after that, I wanted to continue working there, so I was hired as production assistant for the TV station. So I do camera, audio, uh, graphics. Um, I help with the set. So all the background stuff. So that's why you haven't seen me on TV because okay. I haven't gotten in front of the camera yet. But yeah. Well, that's yet. And, <laughs> yet. And then yet. I mean, only if that's a goal, right? Just Facebook yeah. Live. You're, that's all. I, that's how far I've gone. Well, well, I'd have to get on Facebook then, wouldn't I? <laughs> that would probably be more than I could handle. Are you not on Facebook? I'm not on Facebook. Isn't You're missing out. How bad is that? <laughs> I have to ask, I saw there was an article on this topic that you had written, and I admit I didn't read it, but I saw the title. It was about uh, President Trump. Would you like to opine about President Trump's view of the media as the uh, the enemy of the American people? Um, well, yeah, I did. I did publish a column on it, so I'm comfortable talking about it. Yeah, our president does not like the media, and he's made that very clear. I think that's kind of crazy. Because, well, the First Amendment, first of all, (laughs) and just because the media is a staple for our country and our democracy, especially as the most prominent political figure in our country, to basically denounce the media just doesn't make sense Mm -hmm. to me. I covered a bunch of Trump rallies here in Grand Rapids, and I've experienced face-to-face aggression with his supporters. Um, really? Yeah, I've had. Wow. I had people say like, "Oh, we hate the media. You're spies for Hillary. All that, all that stuff." Yeah, um, it was intense. So mm-hmm. that just kind of, it didn't make sense to me because it was my job to go report on this, and I'm interviewing these people, and I'm basically giving him that publicity. Mm-hmm. That's what we basically were doing. We helped give him that publicity in a sense to basically say all these horrible things, it just doesn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you. So I'm going to go out on a limb here on the podcast, <laughs> too. I, I really find it chilling when he says the media is the enemy of the American people. The, I mean, in my view, the media is one of the protectors of democracy. So it's, it's, it's very disturbing to me as well. I can only imagine if I'm in the field how I, I would react. And I, I think it's just awful that, that you would be sort of treated aggressively by folks. The other thing that, that strikes me about the climate we're in, and, and particularly the rhetoric of the current administration, this whole concept of if, if we don't like something, we call it fake news. I don't, I don't even know what fake news is, really. I mean, I guess it's news that we're alleging was made up, just invented out of nowhere. I guess so. I feel like we're living in a really interesting time mm-hmm. uh, where what is reality is, is being contested, mm-hmm. which is very disorienting um, and troubling to me. So as an educator, I think about, you know, how do we combat that? And I don't mean combat Donald Trump. I mean, how do we help students, the voting public, understand the techniques that are being used, how they're being used, and how you really tell fake news from real news? Help me out here, Kayla. Tell me how we're going to do that. (laughs) As a society, we've kind of let technology get ahead of ourselves. There is some fake news that was created by hackers, random people that we don't even know who they are, mm-hmm. that generate Facebook mm-hmm. articles that get shared and shared without being mm-hmm. clicked on. I've heard about that. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> Not being on Facebook personally. Yeah. I think it's definitely going to take some motivation from people as individuals to want to know the truth. Mm-hmm. Just because my experience of being a fellow college student and seeing and talking with my peers, um, I just know that some people just don't care mm-hmm. about their source. They don't, they don't care to check that. I really paid attention in elementary school, and they were telling us the difference between .com and .org. Um, and obviously, <laughs> now that I'm in this field, it, it matters extremely to me. But I just don't think a lot of people care about who their source is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it really is going to take, I think it needs to be taught more in the classroom. Um, and I think it, people need to care really what they're taking in instead of just taking it in subconsciously. Mm-hmm. Or accepting whatever narrative fits your own mm-hmm. ideology. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What do you wish more faculty and staff understood about GRCC students? I mean, and I don't want to say that that faculty and staff wouldn't know this, but I think it's just always important to know at a community college that everyone has a different circumstance and reason as to why they're here. And just from talking to different students, it's so apparent that everyone is on a completely different path. Mm -hmm. It's rare to meet a traditional college student here. So I think that's just important for anyone to keep in mind, even students, when you're talking with other people, that there's it's just a hodgepodge mm-hmm. of diversity here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What what do you like to do outside of journalism and outside of all this classwork you're doing? Honestly, there's not much outside of journalism in my <laughs> <laughs> other part of my life. Um, I have a lot of part-time jobs that keep me really busy, besides the collegiate and then schoolwork at WGVU. TV and radio. Um, I freelance for Review Magazine and Women's Lifestyle Magazine monthly. So um, I do like news here and features there. Um, And then I'm also an intern for a writer who's doing a biography on Betty Ford. So I do research for that. Neat. Um, And then the rest is sleeping. Nobody says that anymore, by the way. (laughs) Neat. Yeah, but neat. (laughs) Oh, that's really exciting. Again, lots of different avenues for you to pursue and you won't lack for offers so thank I, you that i know is that's a fact uh, so now a, re- a really important question thank you noah for reminding me earlier to ask it i've neglected dog person or cat person both both yes all right that's good i have a cat a kitten <laughs> she is maybe six months so she's still pretty young I want a dog one day, though. Okay. So you like pets? Yes. But this is your first kitten? Yes. So you're thinking, wow, are you going to become one, like a crazy cat lady, do you think? No. 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 Okay. Uh, My cat kind of acts like a dog. Oh, okay. So uh, I think we'll be good with her. She doesn't seem to want anyone else to play with. (laughs) Good. Good. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, uh, Name? Coco. Coco. Coco the kitten? Yep. Uh, What color is Coco? (laughs) Uh, she's like a dark brown. Dark brown. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Short hair, long hair? Short. Awesome. Of course, there's not really a bad cat. Do you have cats? I have dogs? a cat. Yes, I... Why, yes, I have a cat. <laughs> His name is Dexter. Aw. And he's a tuxedo. And he still acts like a kitten. <laughs> do you know, uh, do you know this, this, the show on, was it HBO, Dexter? Oh, yeah. I was the- going to say I just finished watching it. So I was going to ask if that's where you got the name from. <laughs> that's where my husband got the name. Okay. Yeah. Interviewing style. How am I doing, Kayla? You're doing good. Okay. Yeah. You think? Yeah. All I right. like the conversation. Do you think I could do hard news? <laughs> I think if you wanted to, you could. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, thank you very much. I, I enjoyed he- hearing more about you. I know my audience will, too. Yeah, thank you. It was an honor to be here. I just wish you all the best in your career. Thank you so much. Oh, Noah reminded me again. And I'll remind you, to all of my colleagues, you are the highly esteemed, much appreciated faculty and staff and students of a very happy provost. Boom. Yes. Good. (laughs) Yay! You've been listening to the GRCC Provost Podcast, produced by GRCC Media Technologies. Join us next episode for more Provost.